So I'm going to move this over here. I know this is not my usual, but I started thinking today. I was, uh, you know, we've been talking about this idea of telling stories, right, and how powerful stories are. Uh, and the message series is really about that and continues to be about that. And, um, you know, that, that first song that uh, Jimmy kind of led us in there, um, I tell you a little story. So it's, it's 2006, and uh, I just uh, come out of uh, seminary, and uh, I just taken six months off. Hadn't worked in six months because I was doing chaplaincy at Edward Hospital, and uh, it was this powerful time. And a friend of mine said, "Hey, you ever think of going to Africa?" And I said, "Yeah, that would be really cool. Once go to Africa." And he said, okay. So the next morning, I get a phone call. He says, okay, I booked our tickets. We're going. I was like, I don't have money for that. And he said, no, no, God will provide. It'll be fine, right? So the next, you know, next few months go quickly. And, and all of a sudden, sure enough, uh, the money came in. And uh, I'm in Africa. And we're, it's 100 degrees or something outside. And we're at the back of this mission station. And he's got his little... Uh, speaker you know and he's got his phone on and it's connected and that song he reigns is playing blasting and and we're in the back two men hanging out in the back of this mission center no one speaks our, we don't speak their language they don't speak ours but we're in the back just praising god in the sun i will never forget it for as long as i live <laughs> no you know, that, that story, though, is, you know, a story of provision. Uh, but there are other stories, right? There's this story, and uh, a friend of mine uh, will really like this story because it's about an Army specialist named uh, Jeff Lewis. He was part of the 82nd Airborne, believe it or not. Yeah, and uh, so Jeff Lewis just gets to his station. He's supposed to be, I call him Remington Raiders, supply chief guy, and he's supposed to be there, and he just gets there. He just gets his desk. He's, he's thinking, you know, I joined the Army, but I don't know if it was for this. I wanted to be part of the Airborne. Oh, I wanted to do all this stuff, and, and so he's there. It's the second day sitting at the desk, and all of a sudden, this email comes across and says, you're scheduled for your first jump uh, report at the airfield today at this time and do that stuff so he just gets up has had no training has just been through basic has had no training all he just gets up and and shows up the airfield and they strap him up he gets in the stuff he goes in the airplane he's looking around he doesn't know any of these guys they say okay we're jumping and he jumps out of the airplane gets to the ground hits the ground all of a sudden the army figures out he wasn't qualified to jump so they ask him a question, you know, oh, why did you jump? Why did you do this? And he says this very clearly. He says, well, uh, the Army said I was an airborne qualified, so I figured uh, I was. So I didn't question it. I just jumped, right? That is obedience. That's a story of great obedience, right? And they told me I could. They told me I should. So I'm going to do it. No fear. Just go and do, right? Think about that for a minute. How many would you, of you would go, okay, let's go jump out of the airplane today, right? right? I don't know. It's a story of obedience, but story forges something among people together. It forges something between us and ideas. It creates a connection that's really powerful. And of course, Jesus used story. We call them parables, 36 of them. And we're talking about those all this summer. And in this case, it's uh, an interesting story that we have for you because in the 36 that he tells, this is one of my favorites because originally it was kind of, um, I struggled with it. I'm just, just telling you the truth. I wrestled with it a little bit. This comes from Luke 19. It's often called the parable of the pounds. And uh, Jesus is in Jericho. Right, he's not too far from uh, Jerusalem, and so here he is. He's he's uh, hanging out, and he's just come in, and uh, you know the little story of Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus is up in the tree, and he tells Zacchaeus, "Hey, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today." You know, he does a, a voluntold. Uh, I'm coming to your house. Cook me a good dinner. We're hanging out, and so now the people are really uh, kind of looking at him, kind of funny. Why would he go there? 
Uh, why would he go to one of the hated people in town? Remember Zacchaeus? He had this reputation. It wasn't such a good reputation. People who were righteous and who went to temple on a regular Saturday, the people who honored everything were just like looking at, why would he go with Zacchaeus? And so right before he goes uh, there, he tells this story in Luke 19. Okay? And uh, so I, I just want you to kind of get the picture Jesus is standing there, right? And Jesus is about to tell a story to these folks. And he's about to tell them uh, this idea that they're not going to like too much. It's going to hit them. So this is Luke 19, verse 12. Jesus said this. A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. So he called ten of his servants, and he gave them ten minions. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Now, I want you to know there were ten servants, okay? I want you to know that a minion, was, or what he gave them, was three months' salary, okay? And you're thinking, man, I would like three months' salary. That would be a really good bonus. Could I get a bonus at three months? And I'm going, well, you did. Okay, your government sent it to you. Okay, now that you got it, right, now that you got that money, all right, I want you to think they just got some free money. They're getting this free money, and now here's where he's going to go with it, okay? So, so now listen up because now you are Jews in the room listening to Jesus, right? Here we go. Verse 14. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made a king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they'd gained in it. The first one came and said, sir, your minion has earned you ten more. Well done, my good servant. His master replied, because you've been trustworthy with a few smaller matters, take charge of ten cities. The second minion came up. second man came up, and he said, sir, your minion has earned you five more. And the man's master answered, you take charge of five cities. Then the third one came up. And the, uh, he said, sir, here's your minion. I gave it and laid it in a piece of cloth. I'm going to give it back to you because I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. <laughs> His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on a deposit so that when I came back I would have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his minya. Take it away from him. Give it to the one who has ten. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. This is Jesus. These are his words. This is his story. I know some of you like the really fluffy cloud Jesus. And, you know, I just really I just love him. He's just so cute and no, 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 Jesus is a little tougher than that. And he's telling a story here. Now, before I get to the point of this, I want you to be aware of something that Jesus told a similar story in Matthew's Gospels called the parable of the talents. And we're going to come back to that. It's a short story about God's given gifts, but this isn't that story. The stories are all told with a definite point a spiritual direction for you and for me and so we need to pay attention to each one specifically because they are teaching us spiritual lessons through the use of story now this story is about 10 servants given the same amount and being asked to go create more go do this now i want you to note a few things first the servants weren't fans of the king, but they were all given the same bonus. 
It's interesting to note only three return back out of ten. We aren't told what happens to the others. We can surmise that they took the money, used it, bought some large flat screen TVs, put it around their house and felt better about it, right? And felt good that they got a little extra and thank you, King. We don't know that for sure. But we do know that those who used it for their own gain, Jesus said, bring them here, and they were judged on the spot. All right? Now, there's an expectation that's kind of written into this. The gift you are given, you are to multiply for the king. Servants are not promised rewards for doing what they are instructed to do. That really should hit some people. Because there's a whole lot of people who tell you, well, you follow Jesus and you get all these rewards, and oh man, it's amazing, and, and you get this and you get that. I, I remember being in a church one time, and they said, well, you know what, if you believe in Jesus and you raise your envelope up, and you say, you know, I'm going to give this to God, and you give that up, you'll get ten times back what you give to God. Now, I'm not saying that God can't produce things, but I'm not saying in this parable, Jesus is telling us very clearly, no, I gave you some things to be clear, to multiply, so that the kingdom moves forward. This story is about three different responses to what God has given all of us. The first one's obedience. The second one's disobedience. And the third one's outright rebellion, obedience. The parable teaches us that our gifts and abilities may be different, but our job is the same. We are to share the word of God, the good news of God, so that it multiplies from us and moves out into the world. We are to share it through his spirit, which we are all equipped with equally. You and me, we have the same gifts. Yeah, I can get up here and I can talk in front of you and it's fine and maybe this isn't your gift, but you've got a gift and God has placed it among you. And I don't know what that gift is, but he says, move with that. Right? You are to be obedient with it. And the reward for faithful work, get this, is more work. Did you hear that? The reward for faithfulness is more work. And, and we shouldn't go, well, you know, that doesn't seem fair. I, I did my part. I did what I needed to do. And yeah, somebody else should do that. Right. No, that's not what he says. What he's saying here is that it's a compliment from God to you to go do it again. And I'm going to give you more. I trust you enough that I'm going to give it to you. Your obedience means I'm going to give you more to do more with. So that maybe you come back with five and he says, okay, I'm going to give you five more. Here's a bigger challenge. Go. Guess what? More work. <laughs> well, wait a minute. I've been doing it my whole life. Don't I get to rest? No. Take a Sabbath. Get back in the game. Let's go, right? And the second reaction is disobedience. Kind of hitting on that a little bit, right? The parable recites the basic Christian principle that wasted opportunity means a loss of reward and the possible loss of the privilege of service. It's a privilege to serve God. It's a privilege to understand that you have now met God, you've asked him to be in your life, and he says, great, let's get to work. It's not, oh, no, no, you get to sit there on the cloud and wait for him to show up. No, it's time to go, baby, and it's time to get going. Now, there's a great preacher story. Uh, Gentleman dies, goes up to heaven, uh, 
we'll use St. Peter for the tour guide, whatever. He goes up to heaven, he's hanging, hanging out, and St. Peter's like, come on, I'm going to show you around the place, I'm going to show you what we got here. I know they told you it was about clouds and people dancing on clouds, but I got a little bit more for you, let me take you a walk through, through heaven with you. And so he's walking with the guy, the guy's asking him questions, he looks over to the right, and there's this huge warehouse. He says, what's over there? St. Peter goes, oh, you don't want to go over there. No, no, I want to go over there. That looks like a fun place. Like th- that looks like Chuck E. Cheese on steroids. Let's go over there. He says, no, you, you really don't want to go. No, no, I want to go over to the warehouse. Says, okay. So St. Peter walks him over to the front door. They open the door, and it's like the largest warehouse you've ever seen. And on it are racks and racks of boxes, some small boxes, some big boxes. And the man looks at St. Peter and goes, what's in the boxes? And St. Pete goes, well, These are all the unanswered blessings that God wanted to give his people. What? Yeah, the unanswered blessings. Huh. Is there a box with my name on it? Well, let's find out. So he fires up the computer in heaven. Sure enough, everything comes up. Little thing comes down. It's like an Amazon warehouse. And this big box shows up right in front of him. It's got the guy's name on it. It's right there. It's hanging out. And the guy's like, well, what is this? So this, this is the unanswered blessings. This is, this is the place where God gave you an opportunity to serve and you chose not to. You passed it by. God wanted to give you a blessing, but you chose not to share the message. Or you chose not to bless that other person. Or you took what you had and you were selfish. And so God couldn't give you the blessing because then God wouldn't be just. It wouldn't be righteous. So God said, put it in the box. Your disobedience kept you. From a blessing. Oh man. (laughs) So you got obedience and disobedience and now pure outright rebellion. You know the rebellious type. We're living in a time between the command to do something and the inheritance that the king has promised. We're in this kind of twilight zone in between what you could get and what and not yet. So we're in this really interesting place, right? And so God is saying to you, I've come. You've known that through Jesus. You saw me. You heard me. You committed your life to me. And I'm coming. So I want everyone to use their gifts and their talents and their resources for the furtherment of the kingdom. Because I want everybody to hang out. And then some say, well, you know what? (laughs) I don't know that God gave me that. I know that I didn't get to choose where I was born because if I would have been chosen where I was born in some other world, you know, I don't know if I would have chose the place where 97% of the wealth is in the world. I don't know if that's really a blessing. You know, and I don't know that the fact that even if you're at the poverty level in the United States, you're still in the 93rd percentile for people with resources. I know you may be saying, well, Pastor, you don't understand. I can't pay my bills. I got all this other stuff going, and I'd be telling you, well, yeah, you're still in the wealthiest percentage. Now, there are people who feel no obligation because God has gifted them. They did it on their own, they'll tell you. I'm a self-made person. I came from nothing. My parents didn't have anything. I did it all on my own. I'm smarter than the average bear. Okay, boo-boo. That's what it means, right? At some point, you have to understand that it was God who gave it all to you. The picnic of life that's been laid out before you has been given to you from God. And there are people who go, oh, no. And these people are all around us. Let me just share some examples. There's the business person who acquires more and shares none of it. There's the parent who raises the children for the praises of culture but fails to give God all he's due. There's the student who is successful but casts out dispersions on the less than. 
There's the person who thinks because they were born here, have more, bigger, stronger, whatever the case might be, can bully another. It's the gifted who fail to help the, those in need. You see, these unfaithful servants are the ones who are selfish and self-centered. They're the ones who turn away from the scriptural idea that to whom much is given, much is required. You can look that one up. That's Luke 12, 48. It means we are held responsible for what we have. If we have been blessed with talents and wealth and knowledge and time, it's expected of us to benefit the king by benefiting others. It's expected. So the question before Peter comes up today, from me to you, is if the king returns today, which category do you fall into? Obedience, disobedience, or rebellion? Would you be the one that the newspaper interviewed about following the orders or the one who was looking at the box full of blessings that never were given? Or were you the one who, who quite frankly, knew what you had but didn't give credit to who gave it to you? 